for further recording anyway. So, all right, we are recording now. Um, and George, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, I mean, um, who uh, does anyone have? Does anyone want to jump in and volunteer uh, to show us what they were working on this week? Either one of our if, teams. If we can go second, that would be super helpful because I'm still trying to load everything up because when I opened my computer this morning, it was like doing all of the updates. Hold on a minute. So not everything is loaded and ready. Okay, all good. Um, so is the other team ready to go? Yeah, I'll go. Go for it. Floor is yours. Patrick, we see your screen, but you are muted. Just heads up, if you didn't know. There we go. OK. Um, so this week, we were tasked to filter th the item list. Um, so we import use state. Uh, we create search query. Um, and we set that to an empty string. We have this clear input function, which will be used to clear the input if the input length is greater than um, zero. Um, and it just sets it back to an empty string. And then we create a form here. The form has a label for accessibility, um, just filter items. And then this input here, type of text, um, the name is search items, value is equal to the search query state, um, placeholder autocomplete off. On change, it sets search query to e.target.value, which will um, update the state every time the user changes the input. Um, and then here, if the search if search query is true, then a button shows up that just says clear, so you can clear the input. Um, as for the filtering, we take the data that is coming in from Firestore, we filter that item, or we filter it um, if the item name includes the search query. Uh, and then uh, we map through that filtered list and return the list item. Um, in practice, we have this lovely list. And if I want to search for the gravy, um, right when I press G, it will filter. And then I can press clear to clear the, the input, or I can do candy. Um, let me make something that is like also starts with like a C, like um, crust or something. I don't know. And so then I did it twice. So crust will come up if I do CR, but if I just do C, it will sh just do all of the uh, tasks that or items that start with a C. And that's pretty much it. Nice. Um, I'm I'm curious to know, like, what was um, if there was anything particularly challenging about this issue for y'all? Like, what what did you spend the bulk of your time working on for that issue? Um, one second. We probably the most difficult part was figuring out the best way to filter. Um, I know there would be a couple of uh, ways to do it. Um, I think this was just the easiest way to just manipulate the all the data coming in and then just map through it. And that's just what I've done in the past. But um, I know that you could make like another array, um, like a another state variable as like an array and assign all of the filtered tasks to that um, state variable and then display the state variable and do like some 
conditional rendering based on like if the input field is full then show the state the filtered state and if um if it's not then just show like the data uh but other than that i think um it was relatively easy we also were wondering whether um you know this filter needs to be in another um not with the map join with the map so that uh in later uh when we get to the other part of the code in the later issues um, we we might have to change but for now we kept it that way so that um if necessary we will change later that was the main issue issue we had like what to do whether to join with the map and then uh, do it or do it in a separate like Patrick said put a variable and conditional so we were not sure but just for this issue this works so we kept it that way and in case we need to change we can change it later yeah, I think that's a, a great um, instinct. You don't need to over optimize for, you know, too early on, like sticking to the scope of your ticket uh, was a good call. I think there was another um, piece of the functionality um, that I noticed um, when I was reviewing your PR, but um, I don't think we saw it in, in your demo, but can you talk to us about why you had like the, in your function, you had two lowercase um, when you were filtering through the, um, through the yeah. filter <laughs> um so if i if we were to just do item name um if item name includes search query uh if a user typed in milk with a capital m it, it wouldn't work um so everything to lowercase will just uh will allow a user to do all caps and it would still work yeah, nice. And I think that that functionality is a lot more user friendly um, because you wouldn't expect capitalization to affect that. But obviously, if you hadn't put that, it would have affected it. So nice. Very nice job, y'all. Yeah, great job. Um, that's Thank a really you. common. Yeah, that's a really common part of like date, a tiny bit of data normalization. So it's really a good way to kind of it's a good way to go go about it, doing something similar, similar like that. Cool. Um, did we do the visual part of that? Sorry, I missed. I was away from my desk for like two seconds. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, Caitlin, are you good to go or? Yes, I'm ready. All right, go for it. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so our uh, issue this week was um the like part two of the user token um so what we were doing was hold on let me just adjust my um my thing here so it's out of the way um so what we had to do was we had to um take that unique token that we created last week um and then allow other people to use that unique unique token so that you could share lists between people. Um, so what we did first was we um, looked at Firestore, Firebase Firestore, to see um, how we could go about um, getting that token and then um, looking at what data was being stored in Firestore with that token. And so what we found was that the token was being used as a collection. Um, so we use the query, um, uh, like built-in query parameter of Firestore to basically go through the collections um, in the database and say, if they have matching list IDs, then we want to get all of the docs that are associated with that collection. Um, and what that allowed us to do was then we could, when the person typed in that tree, token three word token then um and hit enter then they would see the items come up that were in that list um we also made sure that we had a error message if um there was not 
um, a token in the database that matched that, and then it just says invalid token, no existing list. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it over to Nuria to give you a visual show. Yeah, hi guys, let me start. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, so here our visual. So we are in the home page. It has a like option to create list or join the existing list. So now we have a, like angel size double. We get this from the list collection. Uh, from Firebase, this token, and here you go. You can join, you can start uh, filtering. You can see the list, but if you enter the wrong uh, name for, it will give you an error. Yep, that's our part. Very nice, great job, y'all. I, um, I'm curious to know, as y'all are working with Firebase and Firestore, if uh, you have run into any, any challenges in figuring out like how to use the documents or like where, like what has your learning process been like with using Firestore or have, do you have experience using it before? I had used it once before for a hackathon project, um, but I really hadn't touched it, it was just like part of our project. Um, so I'd like accessed it from the site, but I hadn't done much of the coding. So I was like pretty new to it. And I really enjoyed doing this ticket this week because it was so much fun to go through all the documentation and look at all of the various different ways that you could query and search through the database. Um, and we started out down one path. And then when I found um, the other option, we were like, oh, let's try that one. And so we kind of went down a different path. Um, so I, I think their documentation has done really well. It's really easy to follow. Um, and there were lots of different um, access points in the documentation for similar ideas, which I was very appreciative of because sometimes with the documentation, it's like if you don't know exactly the precise words, then like you have no hope. Um, so yeah, it was really fun to learn about uh, the different ways that you can search through the database. That's awesome. Glad to hear that. Definitely. Um, a lot of the times documentation can be very hit or miss, so glad that it's you know kind of worked out. Cool. Um, I think that was it, unless anyone ha has any other questions. Nope. All right. Well, good job, y'all. Um, I think uh, next we're going to go into a learning module about paired programming. And Volha, I believe, is going to go over that. Yes, absolutely. Let me share my screen with you. All right, perfect. Can you guys see my screen? All right, fantastic. So today I wanna to chat with you about pair programming and um, it is something that you have already experienced. So I would be curious to hear um, how it has been going for you after as well. So in a classical sense, pair programming is when two developers get together in front of a computer and work on completing a task and write code a code using just one um, keyboard. So usually there are two main roles. Um, it is a driver and navigator. So a driver is in charge of the keyboard and actual typing. So they think about approaching it um, in a low level and they think about low level about the code as well. Um, usually driver would uh, speak out loud how what is he thinking? How is he thinking um, as a type? And um, 
uh, they would try to um, come come up with a consensus with a navigator on whether um, on how to approach certain things. So the navigator they kind of think of um, things on a bird eye level, so on a higher level, and um, they are usually in charge of um, supporting the driver and helping them throughout the process, um, uh, looking some things up for them, um, as well as um, asking questions about what the driver is doing. So, um, and after that, people would switch roles. Um, before the pandemic, um, it was done in person when two developers would actually be sitting or standing next to each other. And of course, the pandemic changed the rules a little bit. So let's talk about pairing remotely, which um, you have been doing so far. So um, there are a lot of different tools that could help you succeed uh, during this process. And I will be sharing some of the links with you as well as slides. Um, and we'll talk about some of the tools. Um, so the life cycle for this process would be as follows. Um, the developers would jump on a call <laughs> and uh, one, uh, the, someone would share the screen or they would use a collaborative tool where um, they would be accessing the same environment at the same time. Um, so, and they would be going through the process switching roles. So the first person would be the driver and um, they would share their screen and a code um, while the navigator will be providing the feedback for them and um, kind of following up and asking um, about the process and about their logic. And then um, usually it gets split up into smaller digestible chunks. So it wouldn't be like one person would be a driver for hours and another person would be a navigator for hours. Ideally, you want to find the perfect balance where um, you would be finishing a smaller chunk of the code, right? And then you would be switching. So uh, both people can experience uh, both of the roles. So uh, once the driver pushes the code to the repo, um, the navigator will pull this code down and they will switch and the process will continue. So the driver would become a navigator and the navigator would become the driver. And um, you continue <laughs> with the main idea to get the job done. And um, there are also a few rules and um, kind of an etiquette that is associated with pair programming. Um, first of all, I think the main idea is um, pair programming is a lot about embracing um, the curiosity, embracing the learning mindset. Um, and um, it's an amazing learning opportunity for you to, to get inside someone else's head and to, to see how they think. Um, it's a lot about um, being open to go outside of your um, known paths and your regular ways. Sometimes it, it could be challenging um, to, um, uh, to like we all have different ways of thinking about things. And um, as we code, we also build some practices that we get accustomed to. However, it is very important to keep an open mind and um, to allow yourself to see what the other person is doing, to question it, but um, not in an aggressive way, but uh, from coming from the point of curiosity as well, right? Like to try and to understand how 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 others person think and works, and also it's a great way to um, uh, to communicate with each other and find a common ground because at the end of the day you have a final goal, right? You want to complete a certain uh, piece of work that would contribute to your team or to your project that you're currently working on, and. Um, also, it is important to be respectful, <laughs> respectful um, as a driver, as a navigator, and um, just um, not, it's not about show, it's not about showing off and like trying to push your ideas on another person. It's about um, learning and coming up with a solution together. So I would be curious um, to hear how your pair programming has been so far and um, if anyone wants to volunteer and share perhaps between the collabies and then maybe mentors can go um, about their experience with pair programming and how it changed over time does it sound good perfect um, any any volunteers <laughs> Um, one thing that I'll say is that the cool thing about using VS Code, I know that not everyone uses VS Code, but one of the cool things is there's collaboration um, 
add on their extension, which um, because I've only ever coded in a virtual world um, and I've like predominantly used that, I didn't even know that normal, normal pair programming was like one person typing um, because I'm so used to both people being able to contribute at the same time, the same code base. Um, so it's really interesting to think about like, yeah, before that you would have had to just sit there and one person would have typed. <laughs> For sure. Kind of like letting go of this control, right? <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I would share, I had a great experience with all my collabs. We all discuss, uh, agree or disagree. And yeah, we make it work. If I didn't know how to do like VS Code live share, I had the trouble, but one of my collabs, they knew it and explained it was easy Then done. I was learning. <laughs> yeah, all good thing. I love it. Anyone else wants to uh, volunteer uh, of the collaborators? You don't have to, it's just if you want to share. If not, we can go to the mentors. Uh, I don't think it's per se that we have done the driver and the navigator um, parts, but I do think we have come to an agreement with all the collabies, like this is the way to do it, but it, we haven't literally implemented that part. So going forward, I think we will keep in mind and implement that part. As, as I said, we come to an agreement before we do anything, but the driving and navigating we haven't done so far. And that's okay, it's a different setup and you are learning, right? So um, I will also be sharing the slides with resources for you and you can uh, read a little bit more about the payer programming, about the roles and see what works for you because in the end of the day, we all are different, right? There is a book definition of how it's supposed to be done. And with two people working together, there is always a balance and there's always a collaboration what works exactly for you. Right, Caitlin, George, do you want to share a little bit how it works for you in your current uh, roles and how it progressed over time? Sure. Um, oh, sorry, George, you go, you go first. Uh, no, that's, yeah, I'll go first. That's fine. <laughs> we don't have to go back and forth saying you can go first. Um, all right. Um, so let me think. So right now, I'll go back to like when I was doing pretty heavily doing pair programming because in my last job we that was huge that we were doing pair programming we did a lot of collaboration but sitting down and doing pair programming wasn't something that we really had the time to do because uh, it was a very small team and we had too much going on to really dedicate to do something like that it was a lot yeah but before that uh, in my last job we actually did a ton of pair programming because i was working with um, a couple of contractors so guy i got i got really lucky in this because i worked with this person who was um had literal decades of experience uh programming and it was awesome because it was one of the best learning experiences of my career because i almost he i kind of 10x my knowledge from the time that i was working with him because he just knew so knew so much and that formula works out and there's a reason that formula exists only because you're gonna run into people trying to code the same thing at the same time. And it's a lot easier just to kind of have one person doing the driving and one person kind of just helping you think through all, think through all your knowledge. And like I said, if you get, um, when you get, when you start to go go looking for job, jobs and stuff, uh, if, if look, if you come across a company, a good question to ask them is like, what is their, do they have a culture around pair programming? Because it does help a great deal because not only will you get work done much faster, but if you get the opportunity to pair with somebody who like has a different set of experience, uh, more, more or less experience than you, you can help teach them or you can learn a ton from them. Um, so that's definitely like a thing that to kind of keep in mind when you're going for like your interviews and stuff, if you decide to like jump into like a tech company um 
because I can say from personal experience, it's a great, great way to get work done and learn a ton, a ton of stuff really quickly. Yeah, I, I totally agree that it's, it's a great way to learn. I would also say like, even if you are more junior than the person you're pairing with, like I, I tend to feel like some stage fright about pair programming sometimes, but it's as much as you can push yourself to do pair programming, you can sometimes be teaching even someone who's very, very senior, like they might have so much experience that they just like automatically are doing things like following a certain pattern and not really um, thinking uh, as much about the different avenues for solving something as someone who's a little bit newer to the team might, you, you, you might be kind of thinking about lots of different options. Like that's just one example of how you can help um, even if, you know, you feel like you're not going to be able to contribute. Like, I don't think that's ever true. Uh, I think people can always learn from each other's experiences. Um, and it's obviously like a great way to learn from someone else. Even I think during my office hour, someone was saying you can even learn like different tips for VS code, you know, like shortcuts or something like that kind of stuff is also really valuable on top of learning coding concepts. Um, and I'll also say like, um, when I am pair programming, sometimes I also find myself not following the like driver navigator switch formula, but it can be really helpful, especially if you might not realize like the person you're working with, um, like maybe you are really following what's going on and the other person is just kind of like agreeing with you. So like making sure to switch, kind of make sure that everyone's on the same page and not just kind of one person is kind of uh, at the wheel. Um, it, it can be really helpful, but um, yeah, pair programming is awesome. My team uses it. The team I'm on now uses it a lot more than previous teams I was on. And I think everyone benefits from like understanding like everyone's thinking and like being on the same page. It's and it's, it's a great learning opportunity. Yes, all excellent points. So I agree with all of them. And uh, to add on to it, um, it's everyone has their own coding style. So pair programming is an excellent tool to get exposure to how other people's brain work and how they write their code. Um, because during your career, you'll be touching a lot of different code bases and a lot of different code and it's really cool to have an ability to um, distinguish what, what what's going on and what's happening and have an exposure to and working with other people will help you do that more successful all right fantastic so um just a second so i just so i will be sharing the links with you i just want to open one of them um, it's for some of the um, coding tools that you will be using um, so most of the um, most of the um, environments like Atom or Sublime or Visual Studio, they would have some sort of a tool that you can use for uh, pair programming. So some of them are better than others in terms of some of them only allow you to use um, the terminal, right, or just the code. And some of them would also, like a, for example, like a code pen, they would also have um, for web development, they would also have the rendering of the page, which, which could be really cool to see that in real time. Um, and um, of course, it's a matter of the preference of you and another person. Um, and I will be sharing the slides with you. Then that's everything I have for the learning module. And if you have any questions or any comments, I'll be happy to hear them. Love it. Thanks, Volha. That was like, I think everyone hopefully will be able to put to practice some of that pair programming um, advice this week. And yeah, definitely check out those resources once Volha sends them out. Um, okay, did anyone have any questions about, about that um, learning module or anything else so far? Or comments? Okay, cool. In that case, we're gonna jump into looking at this week's issues. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so we've cycled through all of the possible pairings of Calabis. So this week, we're gonna be going back to the beginning. Um, and our pairs are going to be Naria and Mira and Caitlin and Patrick. Um, and this week we are going to be looking at issues seven and eight. What's that? Um, so issue seven is that um, as a user, I want to see a welcoming prompt to add my first item if my list is empty to help me get oriented to how the app works. So just, you know, helping our user a little bit um, if we're on our homepage, uh, just kind of figuring out like what 
what you want to do. I think this is a cached version, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, like on our welcoming page, just adding a little bit more context for the user. Um, so the summary is that when a user starts a new list, they need a little guidance on how to get started. Um, think through what you'd want to see as a user and make some intentional user experience decisions that will guide our users in confidently adding their very first item. So this one is a little bit more open-ended than some of the other issues we've seen in the past. It's giving you a little bit of freedom to you know, think through how you want this issue to work exactly. Um, the only accept acceptance criteria is that the list view, when there are no items to display, should show a prompt for example, a button uh, for the user to add their first item. But really, it's kind of up to you how you want this to look. Um, if this list is empty, like, what do you think this app should uh, should look like? Um, any questions about this issue? We also have, let me, sorry, I didn't open this wireframe, but um, this is kind of an example, but again, not very um, prescriptive in how you want this to look. This is just an example. Um, you know, your shopping list is currently empty. Add item um, is kind of an example of, of what you want it to look like. But yeah, be feel free to be creative and start thinking a little bit, like taking a little bit of ownership over this issue um, to make it what you want. OK, and let's look at the other issue before we start assigning them. Um, so this one says, as a user, I want to mark an item on my shopping list as purchased so the app can learn how often I buy different items. So right now we've got our shopping list and it's a list. Um, obviously, like if we want to add more functionality, we want people to be able to remove And In addition to adding items to the list, we want to be able to remove items from the list um, once they've you know, purchased them so that we can start adding that smart functionality of predicting when um, when the user is going to need to buy that item again. So for this one, um, it says that users need a UI that allows them to mark um, that their items are purchased uh, so they can track what on their list they do and do not need to buy. Um, and the acceptance criteria, this one has a little bit more. Um, so we wanna make sure that the list item component renders a checkbox with a semantic label for accessibility. Um, which y'all have been doing like, crushing accessibility, by the way. I'm really impressed with how well you've been thinking about that so far. Um, <clears throat> second acceptance criteria is checking off the item in the UI also updates the date last purchased and total purchases properties on the corresponding Firestore document. So um, this is, again, feeding into that smart shopping list functionality. We want to... Um, not just remove it from the UI, but we want to be updating our database as well um, when the user is checking items off. Um, the third one is that the item is shown as checked for 24 hours after the purchase is made. Um, so in other words, we assume the user does not need to buy the item again for at least one day. After 24 hours, the item unchecks itself so the user can buy it again. Um, right, so like once an item is um, purchased, like it's purchased and then eventually it'll kind of show back up on the list as something that the user might want to buy again. Um, and finally, the update item function in Firebase.js has been filled out and sends updates to the Firestore database when an item is checked or unchecked. So it's another thing is that you can uncheck an item um, and it'll like unpurchase um, the, the item uh, from the database. So this one's a little bit this one has more acceptance criteria than the last one. Does anyone have any questions about this issue? Yeah, if you need time to, if you after processing have, do have questions come up, feel free to ask the mentors. That's what we're here for. Um, hopefully, hopefully this makes sense, but you know, if we need to clarify, we definitely can. And that kind of feedback is always welcome because it'll help improve these issues for future collabies. So don't be shy asking questions. Like it helps us improve the program for future collabies. So think of it that way. Um, okay, and then there were a couple of notes here. So um, while you will need to update multiple parts of the Firestore document for this feature, do not worry about date next purchased yet. This will be addressed in a future issue. So all you're doing is um, right now is just updating date last purchased. Um, for the item and then eventually we'll begin predicting um, date next purchased but you don't need to do that for this issue just updating like when the user has up, uh, has purchased the item um, and then finally 
you can use the Firestore console to test that this feature is working correctly um, by manipulating the value of date last purchased. So um, yeah, when you're trying to test this feature, uh, you don't want to have to wait 24 hours to see if something like disappears from the list. Like you can you can manipulate that um, in the front end uh, just to test how it's working. So just a hint there uh, that will make your life a lot easier and <laughs> will make it so it doesn't take weeks <laughs> to uh, test this issue. Um, okay, uh, so those are the two issues. Um, and reminder, these are our pairs. Um, is there a team that would like to um, that has a preference between issue seven or issue eight? I would like to do issue eight. Issue eight? Oh, perfect. I was going to say I want to do issue seven. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. All right, so, <laughs> so let's get these signs. So issue eight is going to be um, Mira and uh, uh, Nuria. OK, and then issue seven is going to be Caitlin and Patrick. Patrick. All right, there we go. Um, and I'll go ahead and set these up as well. So we've got issues. Uh, these two are going to be issue eight. And our other pair is going to be um, Caitlin and Patrick with issue seven. Um, all right, so we've got a few minutes here. Did anyone have um, any questions? Well, I've already asked if you have questions about the issues. No questions about the issues. Was there anything, since we've got a little bit of extra time today, was there anything unrelated to these issues or, um, I mean, related or unrelated to issues or our learning module um, that y'all wanted to talk about? Like anything that's been challenging for you um, the past few weeks um, that you wanted advice on? I know some people have mentioned Git perhaps, or like, um, I don't know if there's any, we can consider this like a mini office hour if you have questions, or if not, we can break early today. No questions so far, we need to process it first. Very fair. Um, and Volha did just mention in the chat that uh, she will be hosting office hours this week. So um, yeah, feel free to come to those with questions um, once you've had time to process this week's issue and get started on it. Um, and yeah, and we'll be and she'll be sending out an invite um, so it's on your calendars. Um, okay, any any last thoughts before we wrap today? You guys are speed machines with your issues and with getting through our first <laughs> sync today. Um, love it. Okay, well, um, happy Saturday. Enjoy your weekends. And um, yeah, reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Have a good weekend.